I think they're hiding it for because of the energy, the free energy. Like if we if we reverse engineered any of these things, if if the if the stuff's not you have if you know they're kind of stuck in a conundrum here, right? If it's not ETs, and it's from the planet somewhere, and it's some hidden technology, then the hidden technology should be used for good. You know, we should be using it for clean energy or at least maybe even free energy. I mean, it's it's and this is what some of the guys have been fighting for decades against, like. Hello and welcome to the Alternative Podcast. Uh, we've got Remerica on today with us, uh, which is a fascinating podcast. So I'm going to leave all the links to everything that they do because they do a bunch of stuff all in the description below. Um, but to start off with, do you just want to give us a bit of an intro in, I mean, you've been doing Remerica for a while, I can I can tell. And yeah, give us a bit of an intro in what made you guys start this and a bit, a bit about the journey that you've been on so far. Sure. Well, we, we started it because we were going to these conferences, like Darren and I were both into ancient mysteries. And, and so it started kind of like with the whole alternative history, ancient mysteries, UFOs and all that kind of stuff in 2013. And we went to these conferences and we were meeting all these cool like researchers. And we said, well, you know, we should start a podcast too. Cause at the time I put Darren on to mysterious universe. I think it was the, was the main podcast that I like, I was in Grundy. Yeah, that's the only one I had at that time. I was like, I listened to every single one of their episodes before I ever listened to anything else. Yeah, yeah, and I and I had a weird synchronicity finding Ben Grundy online, like very strange synchronicity. So um, we can get into that later if you want, or or uh, and then anyways, we started up this podcast, and then you know, and then you know, of course, conspiracies like this kind of blend into like now it's sort of the pop culture political war that we're in. Like it's now everything is is politicized. So, you know, we were struggling during COVID because we didn't know how to handle uh, how to handle this this car crash conspiracy that we're living through, this slow car crash and we're like, do we keep talking about it on this old show that we've been doing for years because we were starting to get strikes on YouTube and we were starting to get really censored. Like we we saw a little bit of censorship prior, but this was this was bad. So we decided to like let's we let's repurpose this old feed that we had. We kind of had a second feed where we were doing sort of more sort of risque, risque conversations. And we thought, let's repurpose that into Grimerica Outlawed. And then we can do these long form, you know, premium sort of for the second half is premium for, and we can ha hit all this sort of like the real controversial shit, you know, the jab, the sort of the global kind of takeover, the crimes against humanity, like all this stuff that we can't really, you know, and we sort of tried to protect a little bit, protect our original brand. So we kept that one going and uh, and that's kind of been the journey we're on. So for a lot, you know, now we're expanding sort of again. We're doing sort of a, an extra show every week just with Darren and I talking about current events in a way a little bit because we really don't have an, an all, we, we it's an interview style podcast. So we don't really have like a, a way to vent our own stuff that we and we end up accumulating all kinds of stuff just from, you know, with with just the stuff we I mean, we do it. This is kind of my job now. So. You know, we do that uh, once a week as well now, and, and we're on Substack, so we're kind of trying to expand into these sort of more sort of video realms. Instead of doing an audio podcast, we do we do now videos, and, and we do it live. We went back into trying to do it that way because of the the new environment that we're in. I guess that's kind yeah. of a, a quick summary. And a lot of people are because in the past, not not even that long ago, probably pre pandemic, people what listen to podcasts sort of passively if they were driving, if they were doing the work. Now people, well, even me for example, I'd rather watch a podcast for an hour visually than sit and watch a movie of complete junk that's indoctrinating me completely. But um, yeah, so a lot more people are up for the for the visual side. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask, so you've had some epic guests on your podcast like without a doubt you've had epic guests on and you have had obviously randall carlson on a lot what in your description um of your podcast you've put on a quote <laughs> like a less compromised joe rogan experience <laughs> where do we where do we put that it's on pod, podbay.fm Okay. I just wanted to ask, um, what do you mean by a less compromised Joe Rogan experience? Well, it should be like a zero compromised. I mean, we're, I don't know. Darren, did you did you come up with that? Must have. Yeah. 
Well, at that I mean, time, you could still search all that stuff, right? So we were getting a huge amount of crossover with Joe Rogan. That's when Rogan was doing crazy stuff. You know, he was doing John Anthony West all the time, Graham Hancock, talking about all this stuff. There wasn't taboos. There was no, like, this was way before there was shit you couldn't talk about. You know, you could really talk. We were talking about vaccines. We talked about vaccines for 200 episodes before anything ever happened. And it wasn't until we got a bunch of attention on the vaccine debate. You know, we had 30,000 people watching live and it got downloaded like a quarter million times on Facebook. The Facebook video got watched. That really went viral on Facebook. It took off on Facebook back when you could. And then it ended up getting deleted off of Facebook. And, uh, yeah, this was well before COVID. Yeah. This would have been back in, I would say like 2017, 2016, 2017, 2018, somewhere in there. Right. So what you, you reckon Facebook was the first one to go? Well, there? Facebook took it down and then we got taken out of all the iTunes charts. So we were like consistently in the top 100 society and culture and the top 25 philosophy, you know, like consistently for years. And all of a sudden, after that debate show, we, we didn't appear back in the charts for probably two years before we started sort of peeking back up. But then we started getting into COVID trouble. I mean, by now, we just assume we're not in anything. I haven't checked, to be honest, to see where, what we're at these days, because. Uh... How are you finding? Uh, this is a question that um, I see a lot with smaller podcasts, us included, that there's a constant battle with censorship. And you guys have probably, as you um, mentioned, you've you've seen it sort of at its worst. How are you finding the battle with censorship at this moment in time? Well, before we answer that, I want to be clear on the 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 less compromised. I mean, it's zero compromise. Like we're not compromised whatsoever. So I don't know that that might have come across like, you know, that could be fodder for the deeper conspiracies out there. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some people will pick at anything they can, and, and well, yeah, like I've just asked now. <laughs> We probably didn't word word that properly, but you know, we're like everyone's compromised. Yeah. Well, I don't know, are we? How how so? If not by anything else and by our personal biases. Subconsciouses and biases. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're all brainwashed, that's for sure. Mm, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a big topic right now, the censorship part. I mean, do you, I guess I'll just say what I think and then Darren can pop in, but um I I've been feeling lately that uh Without if if we, if it wasn't for the censorship, we'd all be way better off us independent podcasters. Like we're we just can't. I think we reach a, a level where like we're in the top, not to to be like you know brag or anything like that, but I mean one show's in the top 05 percent and the other one's in one percent. And I don't know how cool like if it's if it's a bit better than that maybe, but even then it's hard to make ends meet with a podcast. Like the discoverability's gone. You know that we can't. We got to be super careful with YouTube. You know, the other platforms don't really have the same kind of dis discoverability from as y Google and YouTube used to have. You know, you can't find it on iTunes anymore. They changed that whole that whole infrastructure. So it's not really like you're discovering it like they used to way back, way back when. Um, you know, Instagram, Darren's been kicked off of Twitter. He can't get back on no matter what. I mean, it, the list goes on and on and on. Spotify deleting episodes like so. It is, it is really hard. You know, you end up in a small little echo chamber and you're not really, it's hard to reach the people that would need to hear this, some of the shows, you know, um, unless they really want to go looking for a podcast, they're not going to really hear about it. You know, you're not going to hear about it on any kind of mainstream platforms or anything like that. I think a lot of these, a lot of our like alternative media style podcasts usually go through word of mouth, usually get sent through through like telegram or whatsapp yep that's you're right that's the way that's really our only real true marketing is, is through word of mouth and putting out a good product and hopefully people like it and pass it on to their friends but even only that goes so far because you know it's uh these are hard topics for people like they you know you don't want to pass it on sometimes to your yeah to your normie friends that need to need to use this stuff yeah because sometimes it's hard enough just to have a conversation with some of the people who are normal in a sense but we need this sort of material to fall onto their laps in a sense because i know oh well uh, just a bit of a background on us i guess as well is through maybe 10 15 years ago it was easier on youtube to stumble across 
this type of information because that's how I've got to where I am today from going down these YouTube rabbit holes back in the day. But now it seems like the only rabbit holes YouTube wants to take you down are, I don't know, Mr. Beast and all that kind of. Uh... Mr. Beast is all right. I, uh, I mean, I don't know. It sucks, I guess. I don't like to think about coulda, woulda, shoulda, exposed to, um, I guess. It's hard to remember that we just got to somehow try and remain grateful that this infrastructure exists and that we have the ability because, I mean, my my grandpa did, couldn't do shit, you know? He could, he could maybe go put some shit under some wipers in his town or he could try and write a book and cram it through a publisher or something like that and we're having top we're censored by the publishers you know it's not an easy road there's probably some lines you could stay within and still you know do pretty good we but as by definition we tend to swerve outside of those lines and i think it's important that people do swerve outside of those lines so you know outside of that the fact that we've got these big tech companies controlling this stuff which is and the plus side pushed us to find different distributors and different alternatives. And I mean, the way I'm looking at it is when, because it's just a matter of time, you know, before a you, I think Facebook has already sort of run its course in a lot of ways. Um, YouTube, Rumble, I mean, Rumble for, for a decade, no one could compete with YouTube. And now all of a sudden you got Rumble with some big fucking names on it. You know, not fucking around. It's not buffering all the time, right? That was the problem with bit shooting all this other shit. Great idea. I go and I, you know, we try and support those things when they first come out, but it's unfucking watchable. You know, I'm not going to watch something buffer for 20 minutes if I don't have to. I'm just not going to. I don't have that kind of time to waste. But now you got Rumbles coming on the scene. And I mean, I don't know what the numbers are. No one's ever going to give us the real numbers. But it's got to be putting a giant fucking dent in YouTube, you know, and maybe it is con creating that echo chamber. But I think, you know, those are always going to exist to a certain extent. It's just sort of maybe exasperated by the Internet now so we can make these echo chambers bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger instead of your just poker buddies on Friday night or your click at work, you know. So they get more dangerous in, from different sides. The extremes can probably get more dangerous. The censorship sucks. You know, we're censored on audiobooks, censored on everything. But at the same time, without these, uh, these companies sort of paved the way. Hopefully they're about to topple over. I mean, Amazon seems to be wavering. I mean, so the way I'm trying to look at it now is that when, when YouTube fucking falls to the wayside or starts to, second place third place fourth place fifth place you got different podcast things coming up now you know i don't know what podcast 2.0's percentage of the market is but it's going up every day it's going to get above spotify real fast if it's not already and it's going to compete with itunes eventually you know it really you know it's been on it's, it gets talked about in the biggest fucking shows in the world and it's it's just up there as a backup as well it can't really be taken down off the internet so I just sort of, I'm excited about seeing these sort of things come up on the side. We're starting to see competition in, in places where there was no competition before. Another podcast directory, another this, another that. And we got lazy. We got complacent. As alternative creators, we took the, oh, I, I mean, we, we were sort of ahead of the curve and hosting our own media and stuff like that. I mean, and we were smart. We'd, we had copies of all of our fucking audio books before they took them down. But I know people are like, ah, oh, fuck, they just deleted all this. They deleted all my YouTube videos. It's all... Because as a community, we got complacent in just thinking that we could take these fucking giant monopolistic companies and we would be fine. And then the mistake that Graham and I made, you know, whether it was a mistake or not, I don't know, is we, we got into bed on such a level with them that we were like, all of our income was based on one fucking company. And they got not all of it. Sorry, that's the wrong thing to say because we have a bunch of different tentacles out. But for our audio books specifically, we had all our eggs in one basket and it turned out to be a rotten fucking basket. And then, you know, that turned out to spur us into this new thing that'll probably end up better. And I think it's just on the plus side, I think even Audible's down like seven or eight percent compared to where it was five years ago on market share. It used to be 68 or 69%. Now they're saying it's 
it's just yeah. a matter of time before people get sick of it. And all of a sudden, those of us who were forced to, I mean, dude, the people who survived these fucking cataclysms as a as a metaphor, the people who survived the cataclysms are the people who can fucking figure it the fuck out because they had to. You know, it seems that there seems to be a correlation with people that have to deal with winter being a little more, you know, maybe innovative than people that don't. I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying that's the way it seems to be. The people that have fucking bad winters had to figure the fuck out how they're going to get through that winter. So that's the same thing with us. We've had a winter of fucking censorship. We've had to figure out how to put this shit on our own servers. We'd have to do this. We'd have to do that. So now when what inevitably happens, because I don't think it doesn't have to be. I think it's going to just be the Atlas Shrugged effect that starts to take these big companies down. They're just too big and entangled. It's like a big complex system that's not going to be, be able to survive the expertise crisis. The same as every other sector. And it's going to get the centralization is coming to an end. I just don't know how fast it's coming to an end. Is it coming to an end in five years, 10 years, and 50 years? But it's breaking down. And it's going to be a, you know, a bad breakdown. We're talking about total supply chain collapse which, you know, a couple billion people rely on to eat. Doesn't seem like it, but there's food and fertilizer and this and that moving all over the fucking planet to these countries that don't have any of it and these countries that have too much. That's all fucking going away, I think, in my lifetime. But if it doesn't, the metaphor is that we've had to adapt, put our stuff on our own servers. So if, you know, a Libsyn goes out of business or this happens or they get bought by this company, that, you know, doesn't affect us. And we've got backups upon backups upon backups so that if something does happen to the servers we've got we can fucking have everything up on another server within our, i mean we're doing it right now it's a pain in the ass we had all our 100 audiobooks deleted but we have fucking backups within backups within backups right up to a fucking hard drive in a faraday bag at graham's house with all of our content on it so that we can repopulate it because they're never shutting down the rss stuff and so that's what we were able to do outside of the Amazon censorship is now, okay, well, we'll find a new distributor. So we're still going to sell all our books here, but we've also been able to create our own thing, which if it can catch wings, you know, we're hoping we can, it's a new way of looking at audiobooks where you can just subscribe for seven bucks a month and get every book we ever make. You know, we're at over a hundred already, or you can listen for free to like two hours of hundreds, a hundred books and counting and get three or four free books every month that sort of rotate out. And we're just trying to do that. It's sort of niche stuff, but maybe, you know, that's the future is more niche places to get audiobooks. That would be what decentralization would look like. And if I'm, you know, if if that does happen, if it does go the way of decentralization, then we'll be, we'll find ourselves ahead of the curve. And more it's pretty creepy. We're more it's resilient. Because because we had, you know, we're making our living, especially me, I was making my living off of uh, these audiobooks. I mean, I was narrating, we narrated like 90, 100 audiobooks, and they just pull the rug out for money. There's no, it's just like, okay, we're, we're shutting your account down. And, uh, you know, there's a there's a reason why. I mean, it's because our, our Kindle account was, was shut down first, and then it's attached to audio. So Amazon has like all the three legs of this Audible thing, right? They have the distributor, they have the Kindle part of it, and then they have the, the audiobook part of it all, all tied into their little monopoly and, and just, you can't even get answers out of them. You know, you can't even get a response from Kindle. And then, and then the, the distributor that shut our audiobooks down, I mean, they, they're not even giving us proper answers. Like, it's like, they won't even tell us really if we're going to be paid for the June sales that they owe us. Like they, you cannot. So it, it just feels, it's, it feel, feels really creepy in a way you're dealing with, it's, it's almost like you're dealing with AI. In a way. I mean, you are for the most part until you get through to a human, but even when you get through to a human, it doesn't feel like a human. I mean, they're just following these weird like protocols they have. And you're like, look, what, you know, what are you doing here? You're, you know, you're, you're shutting this whole thing down with, with no notice. Like, I mean, I guess we had a week's notice. I don't know. It's just creepy. So, so in a way, censorship's a blessing in disguise in the sense. Oh, I'm not saying hey. that. I mean, I don't know that it's a blessing in disguise. I mean, it's actively, making the world a worse place on a daily fucking basis mm. i'm not saying it's a blessing well, it's, it's making the world a, a bad place use. right now yeah but all the time in it's, five years not, time no no can you no, not see the world becoming better because of the censorship? yeah but that's people not, waking up no. to, to the bullshit well they would have waken up a long time ago they would have never been in that fucking 
place if that censorship never existed in the first place. We'd be in a much better place overall. I'm just saying you can use the pressures of that censorship to make yourself more resilient to that censorship and to being canceled in in general. I mean, we're we're just we we've got to be other. You know, we're on the list of most canceled people that you never heard about. We've had you know. We've been shut down in three different company angles now. And I get searched at every border crossing. I mean, it's it's, le it's leaching into real life, you know? Wow. Yeah, that's the reality of it, yeah. So w with the, um, the pandemic and everything that happened over the pandemic, do, do you feel like, what's your thoughts on it being a... Because you, what you've sort of said there is that the big tech companies, they're going to fold in on themselves eventually. Do you think with what they did during the pandemic to sort of push all of the censorship out there, do you think they played their cards, but at the same time sort of dug themselves a, dug themselves a grave in a sense? By I'm sure it didn't help, but my take is just that we've run into the end of the fucking progress of this round of civiliza civilization or at a minimum western civilization we were always running into this demographic collapse in the west we started seeing it a while ago where it wasn't and now in 2008 and 2020 then we have covid and we've just had this mass sort of you know 2008 you had the financial crisis which in the in the West, the U.S. particularly, but all across the West, just caused a mass push out of people that knew what they were doing. You, you know, we got to get rid of people, you know, especially a bunch of older people packaged out, get this, that, that, you know, they're going to be gone in four or five years anyway. So a bunch of old people gone that knew what they were doing. And then COVID came along and a bunch more old people fucking left. And there was already in a bunch of different sectors, especially like the the labor sectors, construction, you know, airplanes, all that kind of stuff. There's already a shortage because we're just not making enough kids. We're trying to immigrate our way out of it. We're trying to immigrate a greater way out of it for a long time. But we're not making enough kids to replace ourselves at the fucking best of times. So it's just, you know, there's all these complex systems that we've got in place require a bunch of people working all the time. You know, there's a bunch of, there's a fucking billion jobs that computers can't do. And we're running into the complete loss of expertise in the hand down of knowledge. I mean, it's, I thought it was in construction. It's in this, it's in that, it's in every sector. Everybody I talk to now says they see the same thing that people, the young people don't know what they're doing. There's no old people there to correct the fucking course. So you've got the ship that's already fucking five or 10 degrees off course. And the problem is that in 90% of cases, there's nobody on that fucking boat that fucking a has the expertise or b gives a shit enough or c isn't scared of getting fucking yelled at for being the guy that says the boat's going the wrong way so that it's just going to veer further and further off course until small things start to break down and they get bigger and bigger and bigger and slowly accelerate until there's no fucking shit on the shelves at your stores not just like there's no this there we've seen the empty shelves here and there it's just going to be fucking empty. Nothing, nothing. Anything that's not made in your country ain't coming there anymore <clears throat> in your lifetime, is my opinion. And I have a bit of a cons more conspiratorial take on it. I mean, I think it's it's kind of the plan. It's the takeover, the, the globalist. I don't even like to use that word, but the globalist takeover of everything. I mean, it shows it with COVID and now they want they want to bring back. They might want to bring back these mandates and and they want the CBDCs and the and the. A social credit score. I mean, it's all you've heard it a million times, but it's happening. It's true, right? Cancel culture just primed everybody to to be you know ready ready for this. Now, whether they overplayed their hand or not, I I think they did. They overplayed their hand, and and people are are waking up, and they might not let it happen this time around. But I also think that sometimes they push us so hard they want us to rebel. So I can't I can't decide myself whether they've overplayed their hand. And everybody's waking up, which will happen. Like they're not gonna, they're not really gonna win. It might still collapse, but I don't think it's gonna be them winning. The people are just. Uh, we have the wild card of consciousness and and humanity and spirituality, which they just they're just too. I think they're too atheistic to even really understand what's happening spiritually. But 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 I can't 
I can't decide whether it's that or whether whether um they're they're literally lying so bad and they're pushing us so hard they want us to re- and we're not rebelling we're not really pushing back enough you know they I feel like they they want us to to push back so then they can really clamp down on us you know kind of like a global martial law type thing like there's uprisings everywhere we can kind of boom really shut things down I don't know who the fuck is running the global fucking clamp down. You know what I mean? Like, it's a bunch of dingbats. Who the fuck is coordinating that? Like, all right, you guys there, you guys there, you guys there. Well, look, all right, look, we're going to take care. We're going to take care. do this. They did it already, dude. Everybody was wearing masks. 85% of our, our country got jabbed. I mean, look, they've already done it. And that's learned, that, yeah, and that's, learned that's a lot that. different than, than a military takeover of the planet. That's just a bunch of fucking sheep. Yeah, but if you look at it like the central banking system that they're going to implant, implement, I don't think those are ever going to work either. Like, I really don't think that these people have the fucking brains to pull off a global digital currency. It's fucking nuts. There's no way that is not going to just fucking completely break the first time they try and turn it on. How many people are in England? You guys are in England, right? How many fucking transactions do you think are having at any fucking given second in Egypt or sorry, in England? It's it's fucking nuts. It's fucking nuts. There's no way it's not breaking. There's no way. It's like those, it's like the COVID apps that they made that we found out weren't actually fucking connected to anything because there was no fucking way to connect it. You can upload a picture of your fucking penis to the arrive can. It don't know because but that's not true. If you uploaded a picture of your dick, it'll probably figure it out because there is some rudimentary AI making sure it's kind of is what it say it is. But there's nobody checking. There's nobody checking. There's like. A quarter million border crossings a day between Canada and the U.S., man. Nobody's checking that shit. They just want you to think they are. They're, and maybe one day they think the computers are going to check it, but I don't think it's happening. There's the, the, there's no way. There's I do no think way. the central banking system does seem like it can, they can pull it off because how long has online banking been out? So they've been building that infrastructure. With How many different companies are running that? Yeah, it's many, many different companies, but they all... 100,000, 100 different, thousand different online bank companies. They're all singing from the same hymn sheet, and there's got to be someone somewhere that's providing them with that hymn sheet. Probably, yeah, but it's still not like... Dude, trust me, they're not even watching that at a high level. I mean, I'm not going to elaborate on it much more than that because I'm not looking to get myself fucking audited, but... Nobody's watching anything. I'm 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 continually convinced that nobody's watching. It's all the fucking house of cards. I mean, you'll get pinched. You'll get pinched for this and that. But there's also certain things that but it's all because of these implied sort of guidelines. And there is a bunch of enforcement all the way down and people watching it. But they're all idiots, too. And, you know, I mean, maybe it could it could get worse before it gets better, but I don't think they can, I don't think, I don't think they have the expertise to fucking keep anything uh, going at a high level without, without total like military clampdown, which is going to be, I mean, historically that's what's always had to happen is if at the end of the day, they've had to pull out the guns. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Because with, uh, what you, you were saying really the best right? they ever had it was us in the West that were content to just shut the fuck up and be debt slaves, but they just got greedier and greedier and greedier and greedier. I mean, maybe not even greedy enough. I mean, there's an awful lot of people out there that haven't had enough of it yet, but it's a fuck around with energy and food that might push these people over the edge. And I mean, maybe some places like the states are going to be able to contain it. But, you know, I don't know how Canada is going to keep a lid on upset people. There's just, you know, unless they have a secret army stashed underground that I don't know about, or they're flying people in from other countries that have the same fucking problem in their country. Like, I don't know how big the the English military is, uh, you know, or or if it'd be willing to go into the streets against its own citizens. I mean, history tells us that it probably will, especially when they get hungry. If they're getting food, they're going to do whatever they're fucking told. Very few countries, I think, have the infrastructure in place to do like the Soviet style or the Maoist style um, 
sort of military takeover of the place. Mind you, Mao snuck it in kind of, so that seems to be the one they're going for this time around. It's more of a, like, eat us from the inside out. If they can turn enough of our own population against us and radicalize them to the level that they'll actually flip it on its head, you know? So wh where do you see the world in, five, well, let's say 10 years' time? I don't know about 10 years, but in 50 years, I see it looking a lot like it did 200 years ago. Except with more cool stuff lying around. And I used to think that was crazy. We had John Michael Greer on like seven, eight years ago, and he was saying all this stuff. He's like, oh, yeah, well, you'll be happy those skyscrapers. You'll be fucking picking the broken glass and metal out of them for spearheads in fucking 100 years. And I was like, this guy's fucking nuts. And and five years later, I'm like, or 10 years later, I'm like, nah, he's fucking on it, man. He was ahead of everyone else. This is where it fucking ends, whether it's fucking few. There's... This is so fragile. We take we take for granted how fragile this whole fucking complex system we've got built is and how little of things can just break the whole thing down and we're starting to we're starting to really fucking tug at some of those foundational poles with some real, you know, we don't know if boys or girls anymore. We don't it's just a matter of time until some of those real pillars start falling down and it's not going to be what what the leftists think it's going to be when that happens. It's not going to be like, you know, freedom for everyone and great, everything, no one's oppressed anymore and black and white and woman and gay, all alike, it's all happy-go-lucky. Now nah, it's going to get real fucked up real fast. Feminism's going to be gone when there's no fucking food and these women are going to be looking for strong men to protect them and take care of them, just like they were 200 years ago. I'm not, you know, this isn't my design. I didn't design the place. I'm just telling you what's going to happen. As these things start to break down and food and blah, blah, blah. For a while, it's going to be money. The rich people are going to be able to have their own private armies or stashes, stuff like that. Oh. But eventually, I think those will those will run out too. I think it could be just this slow, drawn-out collapse of the of Western civilization to it. Some sort of, you know, you're playing in the ruins of the old downtown cores, but there's no more fucking... Cars even flying around, driving around and shit pretty quick. I mean, I would do... I was looking into stashing a bunch of gas, but it's super hard. It's super hard to stash gas because it, even if you add the preservatives and all the stuff to it, you're good. You're going to have a real hard time keeping that gas good for more than a year. A year seems to be like the upper limit for saving gas. So, you know, once the refineries and shit aren't working, what happens then? It, you know, there's so many little things that can stop before there's just a not enough food for people to give a fuck about running their shit anymore, or there's not enough internet, or there's not enough power, or there's not enough fertilizer to grow this, or there's just not enough people. You know, that's what I think. I mean, it's gonna be neat. It's gonna be fun to to ride out. I'm excited. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's gonna be an experience, right? But um, we're gonna be living for. So it's probably too late. The only way out of it would have been subsidized, subsidized having children like 20 years ago. We needed to really subsidize Western families into having Western children, raising them on Western values. And we needed to like not ship manufacturing. You know, we broke it. We broke it when we got, I can't tell exactly when, cause it's been fucked from the get go, but we really, really seem to have broken it with free trade. Which just sounds so wonderful. But that's as near as I can tell, that's the one that really fucking broke everything. Because we turned the, all the poor countries into slaves for the rich countries at the expense of the middle class. Have y'all read Atlas Shrugged? Yeah, you should. That's like the number one book to read, I would say, right now. To get a good idea of where this is heading. Ran was the only one smart enough. She was the only dystopian smart enough to see that you didn't need malevolence. Even though there's plenty of malevolence flying around, all different flavors of malevolence, all you needed was fucking envy and indifference to, to fucking ruin everything. With what... Because what, what you're basically saying is that um, with... All you hear about, I don't know, uh, 
the the World Economic Forum and the Great Reset and all of that stuff. And, and even from the pandemic and what we've seen there, they're, they're, you're basically saying that they've tra- taken a strive towards more control, but it's going to backfire on them big time because they're not going to be able to clasp that control. Well, I mean, I think they got a bunch of people smarter than I am and probably smarter than Ayn Rand was. And if they were had any fucking sense and had access to as much knowledge as they should, they should have seen this coming too. And I think they're just trying to put their own fucking... There's a couple different factions trying to put their own stamp on what was inevitably going to happen anyway. We still don't know what them Chinese ghost cities are for, right? Like, what are they going to do with those? What are those? Dude, there's like fucking seven, eight, maybe more cities in China that have like a 1% population rate. People say it, people say it was like a, a scam, right, Graham? They used to say it was like a, a, a economy scam. What do they call it? The GPA. It was a... Or GP... G, GDP. GDP? Product. GDP, the gross domestic GDP? product. So to cram up the GDP, they were building these cities, but I don't know. Seems fucked up. And all them cities are like below where the where the historic where the ice sheet would have been, you know, b- below the freeze line. Oh yeah, the massive but cities. I think, I think that I mean they're evil bastards, but uh I think they're just trying to put their stamp on something that was inevitably going to happen anyway and figure out how they can maintain some level of control through it. You know, if the money's not going to work anymore, how do they, these fucking billionaires, how does Bill Gates make sure he's still the shit when his dollars are don't exist on the computer screen anymore? You know, that's what they're trying to, they're trying, that's what their reset is, I think, is them trying to figure out how they stay the feudal lords and we stay the fucking plebs well, through whatever is going to fucking happen here. I don't see how war doesn't get spun up into it because that just seems inevitable when people start running out of resources, which is ultimately, I think, what it's going to be at the end of the day by our own design. We didn't like run the planet out of resources by our own fucking stupidity. We're going to fucking run short on resources, whether it's we. You know, we don't want to fucking drill for oil, but we also don't want to mine for the minerals fucking to make the batteries or to push that technology forward. You know, it's just there's all these we don't want to make fertilizer anymore. We don't because it's bad for the environment. Well, so is a bunch of starving fucking people in places like Ireland next to you guys. Right. Ireland is exporting, I think, something like 18 billion dollars worth of food right now per year right now. But we are what happens we all know what happens to ireland if they don't have chemical fertilizer they fucking starve on potatoes that's really all they can grow there when they're not getting all this chemical fertilizer so that food surplus will be gone if that if these fertilizer things kick in so that to me is the main thing people should be keeping an eye on is the fertilizer that's really like seems crazy seems fucking crazy even brazil i don't you grow a lot of Isn't shit. Isn't Ukraine one of the biggest suppliers of fertilizer? Yeah, yeah. Ukraine, Russia, and Canada are the biggest suppliers of fertilizer, I believe. When you mentioned these ghost cities in China, were uh, oh boy, under the. I'm not like an expert um, on ghost cities. All right. But you mentioned that they're under the ice sheets. What did you mean by that? Well, I had now, this is like, I'm just paraphrasing and talking out of my ass. But I watched some stuff a while ago where I can't remember who it was, but it was someone that I trusted was taught showing up with the location of all these cities and where the ice sheet was. You know, there was ice sheets all over. You mean Russia. where the last, night, during, like the younger dries before during, the Yeah, during the ice age. So at the last ice age, where the fucking ice sheets ended, all these cities are below that. I think what obviously what he was alluding to was that he was saying that China was preparing for the return back to the ice age. He could, but he was also saying that China is real good at thinking long term. And I was like, how good at thinking long term can they be when they fucking murdered everybody that was thinking long term 60 years ago? Yeah. <laughs> People forget that that cultural revolution was like in your parents' lifetime. Hmm. China, China starved and murdered 40 million people fucking 60 fucking years ago. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's actually crazy that. Um... The one thing which I struggle to get my head around as well is with modern day science, how much of it is sort of scripted now. So science isn't what science was not even five years or pre, anything pre pandemic, really. But the fact that what they've done with science, they've basically closed the door on it and said, we're now going to move forward with science in the way that we want to move forward with it. But that restricts us completely because if we're entering a bit of a shit show, then we need scientific people, great minds to be thinking outside the box on how to fix things. That's not going to be that's new. I mean, uh, we don't know because we didn't have Twitter last, you know, up until 10 years ago, we didn't have these ways of getting hearing from the Dr. Malone's or the McCullough. Is it McCullough? Right before Joe Rogan and Twitter and uh, the other guy too, Berenson did a great job. Before Twitter and those guys, man, even Graham and I would have had no, you know, you'd know something wasn't right. You'd know something wasn't right, but you would never see those other fucking numbers. And the internet fucked everything, right? Alberta fucked themselves by just reporting their own numbers and people was fucking, were smart enough. The internet got a hold of the Alberta numbers and we're like, hey, wait a second. I mean, I'm not going to say much about it. I don't want to get you guys kicked off anything. Got a hold of the Alberta numbers. And, you know, Berenson gets a hold of them, runs a post. The next day, the Alberta website for that information is taken down. Along with Ontario and and uh, British Columbia. Like, all the provinces took down their data that was very disturbing, showing that it wasn't what they were saying it was, you know? There's always been fucking dudes on the street corner screaming that this shit was going on. And we all saw, thought they were crazy. But now we're those dudes, you know? Everyone in this conversation is one of those dudes on the street corner saying this is nuts. But now we have a way of actually communicating with each other and being like, getting this alternate science out there. 40 years ago, how the fuck would you have ever known that there was an alternative science? So, like, what was the one that what was a lot? Actually, we better not talk about that either. Well, I mean, I think what Darren, I think your scientism question is kind of what I think it fits in with what Darren was saying about the about the collapse. I mean, if we can't even practice real science, how that's not sustainable, you know? I mean, I'm sure there's lots of scientists in their in their labs and in their basements and in their universities, uh, you know, being able to do certain science, but it's not getting they're not getting funding, they're not getting published. So if if you're only funding false science, I mean, that can't last very long. Yeah, yeah. everything that they seem to be doing right now has an expiry date, and that's where the sense of panic comes in. Well, not only that, I mean, I don't know that we could ever trust their science. If we can't trust, is it new? Is it new? So they've just been fucking around since social media and the internet? They just started fucking around then? Or have they just been fucking around for 150 years and we just didn't know any better until now? I mean, we find out that in the 80s, the sugar bought that whole, because here's the saturated fat things, right? It seemed, we were like, wait a minute, this is nuts. A margin is fucking people up. Vegetable oil is fucking people up. All these different oils are fucking people up. But if they go back to butter, bacon fat, all these saturated fats are fine. But you guys, the same age as us, pretty much, maybe a little younger, but, you know, back in the early 90s, all you fucking seen, I think it was the early 90s, might have been late 80s, but around that era was how terrible saturated fat was i grew up in a butterless fucking house until i was an adult wasn't even in my whole family my grandma didn't have it. no one had butter everyone was running this margarine fucking bullshit and cooking in canola oil so did i up until i was 30 something you know and you learn that oh this is why my fucking knees ache all the time this is why my face is so fucking swollen i'm not getting fat i'm fucking inflamed from all this seed oil that i'm not supposed to be eating. and then we find out that oh well for fifty thousand dollars the sugar lobby, whoever the sugar lobby is, you know, they won't even give us the name of who did it. The, they probably do somewhere and I just don't know it. But the sugar lobby turns out that the that saturated fats are only bad for you when they're mixed with refined sugar. But the sugar industry, someone in the sugar industry didn't want that information to get out. So they paid $50,000. And this is all, you know, fact, fact. Check 
to, to skew the results, to, to just leave that sugar part out and say that saturated fats are what's causing the fucking obesity problem. And the obesity problem fucking continued and got worse. And it's still getting worse today because, I mean, I don't know how many people out there are still using margarine. I'm guessing it's still over 50%. Stop using fucking margarine, people. Are you guys on YouTube or? Right I can't now? get my mom to stop using fucking margarine. <laughs> well, it spreads so nicely. I mean, it does spread nicely. The butter's fine. Just leave it out. Um, do you, and I mean, that's not even getting into pharma. I mean, how bad pharma has been over the last 150 years, 100 years, 150 years. I mean, if read the book, uh, mad in America, if you haven't read the book, mad in America already, it's about the, the, the mental, the mental hospitals and the, the history of the psychological, uh, in, industry really. And how they had a solution at one point. They had a solution and, and and they just couldn't go with that solution. They needed to to bring in drugs and they needed to bring in all these procedures that were fucking useless. I mean, all the stuff they did throughout this time were, were all useless. None of it worked, including even up to today, really. And they had a solution, you know, at one point, you know, like sort of like probably a a, a, a very holistic sort of top talk therapy, th therapy solution. Um, do you guys have... Uh, are you guys on, on YouTube right now? Yeah. We, okay. I don't want to, I, I, I have a quote from a book from 1901, uh, no, 1899. Um, I won't, I won't read it, but it's, uh, it's the fallacy of the jabs, uh, going back 125 years now, I guess. And it's the same shit we're dealing with now. You wouldn't believe reading that is like, it's like coming, it's like right from last year. You know, they're not calculating this properly. They're not calculating that properly. They're ignoring this. They're ignoring that. I mean, it's unbelievable. And they're talking about the smallpox one mainly, but same shit we're dealing with now. It's been going on for that long. That'll be an audio book. It's from Alexander Wilder. It'll be on our podcast. It's a short book. It's, it is already. it's already there. Oh, it's already there. I don't, don't want to, I don't want to give you the details because you'll get, you'll get a, a misinformation strike. If you're talking. <laughs> a true strike then. It's yeah. called it's called the Adult Brain Audiobooks Podcast. If people want to listen to it. Cool. I'll leave it in the um description. I'll leave everything that you mentioned, I'll leave in the description below because um it's all good information. You might what? get kicked off YouTube for having us on though. I mean <laughs> Yeah. It's not or, big uh, fans, ours. Well it's like Aaron was saying it could be a blessing in disguise to get kicked off YouTube because we don't want to be YouTube dominant anyway. Um, we are currently in the process of uh, setting up outside of YouTube. At the moment, just primarily on YouTube. Yeah, it's good to... I mean, I used to recommend Libsyn, but I'd still think it's just better to get a server and do it yourself. There's ways to do it with open store stuff like PowerPress and WordPress and Member Press and stuff that you just like, they have no fucking control over. That's the thing. It's like you're not tied to them on a thing where they can shut you off. You have it. It's on your server. Member Press can't say shit about what I'm up to. They have no way of coming in and shutting me down. WordPress can't come and shut me down. People talked years ago. A few years ago, people were talking about they were getting censored by WordPress. That's because they were hosting on WordPress.com. They weren't hosting on their own servers. Oh, yeah. And not only that, even if iTunes or Spotify didn't want to play the, you know, our new audiobook podcast or whatever, it doesn't matter because we can still put it out there as a feed from our own servers. Like it's really, really hard to censor it at that level. If you can't find it in your pod player, it's adultbrain.ca slash feed slash audiobooks. Or you can just go to adultbrain.ca and click on the buttons there to get to it that way and that podcast, uh, the premium and the free version of it are both 100% uh, on our servers with our links. You know, it's, it can't get shut off without a court order. Yeah, it's good that you guys are um, spreading that knowledge on how secure you need to be or how much ownership you need of your own stuff because we need to spread the word, right? Like what me and Aaron are doing is spread the word. We didn't even start this podcast to go down this route we had no choice really because once you wake up you wake up right <laughs> and uh, then you're sort of you're, you're forced to um to fight back against the system but i mean yeah it's important that you guys are sharing this information on ways to set up with full ownership 
But I've got a question for you both, and you can both answer separately. What was it that initially made you guys wake up to all of this? Like from way back when, what was the initial things that, because you've obviously been awake for a long time and that's how you've managed to progress to this level of sort of elite security on your stuff. But what was the initial thing that made you guys sort of think, I can there's something going wrong here? Well, I'll answer that first. I mean, for me, it, it has to be, although I was interested in, in sort of spiritual stuff at, when I was younger, but when I was 20 in 1990, traveling around uh, Europe and the Middle East, I was in Israel and uh, on a rooftop hostel in Tel Aviv. And I saw me and a bunch of people, they saw this twice and I saw it once and I saw this UFO. It was like a dodecahedron shaped craft flying through the air silently. And uh, it was split in half and the halves were rotating against themselves and the whole thing was sort of spinning on its axis. It was very, very, uh, very interesting, you know, and, 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 you know, even like when we were traveling, me and my buddy Dave from the UK, Dave Miller, if you're out there, I'd love to get in contact with you. I've, I, you know, I, I've tried to f contact this guy forever. He was a framer, like a picture framer, like in the back in the day. And he, we would talk to people and about the UFO sighting and like the guy. We went to work on a kibbutz for a couple months, and and the guy there is just like he was so religious he wouldn't even told there's no such thing as UFOs. And we're like, dude, we all saw it in the sky, you know, in, in this rooftop. Um, and that just made me think like, I didn't know what it was, or I didn't even think to, I, I still don't know what it was, but it was enough to know, like, something's not right. I mean, we, we don't accept that these weird shaped things are flying around quietly in the sky. So that was kind of my, and then, and then I went asleep for quite a while, got, got addicted. You know, I started drinking too much and, you know, using too much. I went through the whole addiction thing. Um, and then after getting sober 15 years ago now, um, then I started, you know, that sort of propelled me towards truth again, you know, and I kind of sort of got deep into, into everything after that, which seems to be sort of a bit of a theme. A lot of podcasters I know uh, went through the addiction and, and sobriety kind of things. So. Yeah. So w with your experience with uh, what potentially could be a, a UFO, what do you think about all of the talk at the moment around UFOs or UAPs? As the well, I love all the talk. I just don't think the government's going to give us anything that they don't want. I mean, I think they're hiding it for because of the energy, the free energy. Like if we've if we've reverse engineered any of these things, if if the if the stuff's not you have if you know they're kind of stuck in a conundrum here, right? If it's not ETs, and it's from the planet somewhere, and it's some hidden technology, then the hidden technology should be used for good. You know, we should be using it for clean energy or at least maybe even free energy. I mean, it's, it's, and this is what some of the guys have been fighting for decades against like Stephen Greer and these guys have been like, look, you know, we have to, we have to, we have to work for disclosure because it's going to help us evolve as a planet with better energy. So I think a lot of it's based on that. Yeah. Mm. Their own selfish reasons. Yeah. And they don't want to, they don't want it to come out to, to people. I mean, they're just going to let a little bit of a drip here and there out and, and, but here's the big thing that I, that I think about is, is with this accelerated disclosure, because there's more people believe, I mean, I have friends that never used to believe in this and now they're like, oh, it's all real. Like, so a whole, per, a huge percentage of people are now actually legitimately believing in this. And there's a huge percentage of investigators that are going after this. So there's an increased awareness and in the phenomena, which I believe there is a phenomena, whatever that is, interdimensional, ET, whatever, it, how is that going to react to this? this increase in consciousness about, about itself, the phenomenon. So there, there's going to be, and it's already sort of increasing. I mean, my buddy, uh, my buddy sent his UFO video to move on and some other, other inve like official investigation place. And they both said like, this is unknown. Like we're, we're classifying it as unknown. And it's, and it's, it's one of those typical flashy white orbs in the middle of day. Like you can't, you can really track it, but it's flashing in different spots. It's, um, it's happening increased. It's increasing everywhere. So something is going on. And it is really interesting that, that they're trying to get out of the government or they say they're trying to get out of the government, but you know, I don't rely on the government for any kind of legitimate information on this stuff. There's a lot of talk of um, project Bluebeam. How much do you think has any relevance to what the government are leaking? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's the easy kind of go-to for a lot of people. But we had somebody on, I think we did, or I was listening to it to prep for one of our episodes, and I can't find it. I can't find who said this. But they said Bluebeam's not going to be like, uh, you know, a, a big, huge ship shows up, whether it's a hologram or not, uh, on in all, all these major cities, and everybody's like, oh, the ship's up there, like like right out of V or something like that. It, it's going to be like they destroy a city. We, we destroy a city. Just a complete whether it's an EMP or nuke or something, and then that gets blamed on whatever, right? So they, their version of Bluebeam was much more sort of destructive. It's like, here, like, this is how we get you into Bluebeam. Like, boom, city gone. It was their fault. We have to get, come together as a as a global force and fight that bad thing or whatever it was. Um, I, I kind of would see it going down, especially with what we've been through over the last three years. Like, I could see it going down like that more so than than some other kind of weird, you know, holographic phenomena going on all over the place. You know what I thought about recently though? Blue beam. Like, have you heard about the all the all the the anomalies in Hawaii that the things that are blue aren't uh, aren't burning? Maybe it's Jew beam. <laughs> Can't really that so maybe they call it blue beam because blue stuff is safe. I don't know. Well, so the, the things that are burning in Hawaii, if they're blue, they're not burning. I know, weird, eh? Mm. Us, uh, you guys better mm. fact check that. <laughs> <laughs> I have no reason to believe that this is true. I mean, are your balls like burning? It. Are your blue balls burning? My, balls not blue, <laughs> I'm My fiance is a saint. Um, I can't remember when I woke up. When did I wake up, Graham? I would say I just I've been just sort of slowly radicalizing for a decade. I've reached pretty close to peak radicalization. That's all. I, I went from just being interested in mysteries and shit to just, you know, if they would have just stayed, kept their foot off the gas, they could have kept guys like me not really giving a fuck what the government was up to. And I'm an Indian, for fuck's sakes, you know? And they could have kept me shut the fuck up, but they just couldn't, so. Now, uh... It's too late now. They've they've gotten involved. Everything got really personal, you know? For the longest time, like, it didn't matter because nothing really happened to you. They kept things going pretty smooth in the 90s. Late 90s was great. You know, early 2000s, even after 9-11, it was a bit, you know, a bit creepy and all that. But now they just, they're getting too involved. They're They're just starting to hit everybody real personally, you know? Now you're seeing friends and family members, um, you know, getting sick or, or worse, and nobody's talking about it. They're still pushing the procedures. I mean, it's like, what is going on in this world? Yeah. And I think as well, because they're doing it from so many different directions, because obviously I'm what, you, watch, you watch something on Netflix to try and relax, and if you're awake, then you sort of watch it and think, oh, why, have they, why are they putting that into this? And it's it. What, how I feel anyway. It seems like how do you even escape this? Like, you can't even turn away and look away from it because then you'll be facing something else, which is just indoctrinating you as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they have to ruin all these old shows, like the old uh, canon of shows. Like, can't you just keep, you know, Lord of the Rings and the Wheel of Time and Star Wars? I like, can't just keep it good. You know, the authors were were pretty good. They were pretty brilliant. It was very mythologically based they're getting rid of the hero's journey you know they don't want they don't want the hero's journey anymore you know they're just glorifying the criminals and and they don't want the hero's journey like they're really just erasing mythology and archi archetypes it's crazy and um, i noticed on your channel you've had rundle carlson on quite a bit um i just got a, a question and i wonder if you've randall's discussed this with you um he was on the rogan podcast and he mentioned that he's working with a group of people that are trying to rediscover ancient technologies yeah 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 i've talked to the guy before yeah have you spoke to him yeah okay i was just wondering if you could uh share so a bit more info on that who's this bendall yeah malcolm bendall Graham yeah. is probably closer to the bendall thing than most people yeah I'm, i've been pretty close i mean he's I, been I read talking his book. to malcolm yeah 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 i've been talking to him um he's I think it's legit. I mean, here, would, would you want me to try and summarize what it is or? 
You should start by just getting clear right away so everyone's eyes aren't, they see an unglaze everyone's ears right off the bat, that it's not fucking free energy. Because I think that's what everyone gets carried away. Well, it's not free energy, they'll kill, but it's not that. It's not free energy. It's just something that probably should have happened a long time ago. You know, this is sort of one of those things where if we didn't have the the handcuffs on, the different innovations in, you know, nuclear and gasoline and the the fuels we're using now that seem to be given to us an abundant supply by the planet could be used more efficiently. Um, I can read from actually, so I, I know a guy in a chat that went down to see uh, a, a demonstration with an engine. So the brilliant thing about this is it can sort of be attached to any kind of combustion engine, apparently like diesel gas, whatever it is, it can be attached. And, and the gist of it is it, it, it harnesses the, the waste energy and the waste and the waste heat, and it increases the efficiency, but it also transmutes the exhaust. So it changes the exhaust from carbon dioxide to oxygen is, the, is sort of the gist. And it's all based on sacred, sacred geometry and ancient wisdom, like the Vajra from India. I mean, it's, we have a, a good clip of Randall talking about it um, on our show here, but I just want to read, maybe I can read this. Uh, I mean, you know, do you guys, uh, this is video. Should I share my screen quickly here? I don't know if this guy, if I don't know if I'm allowed to do this. Um, it's just a private, this is a private uh, uh, schematic. So it's not even from Malcolm himself. It's from, uh, it's from a guy that showed it, it privately. Can you see it here? So this this is almost like the best way to explain it, and and I hope I'm allowed to show this. But this so the, this fresh this is the unit operation number one. So there's this this pre ionizer that takes this fresh air in, um, this pre ionized air. It goes into this diffuser, a bubbler where there's just water in there. So you put water in there, tap water. They're doing it off of tap water so that anybody can sort of do it. You don't need to distill water or anything like that. So it makes these bubbles, and then this the bubbles cavitate and they create these plasma, these mini plasmoids that are contained in their, their own electromagnetic field. And then it comes into this thunderstorm generator, which is all built on, this is all like technology that's been, people have used it in the past. It's like a swirl guide where it takes hot air and cold air and it swirls it um, in opposite directions. So it comes up, comes up here that this is the infused air comes up here. Um, the thunderstorm generator, it's, it's a rank, ice vortex it's a vortex tube i guess and then it and then it's so that some of it goes into the goes in this way the plasmoid air mixture goes up into the engine and the the hot air comes down out of the exhaust so and then this is the top of the engine here where it goes fresh air carburetor fuel air mixture custom aluminum there's an add-on block here to connect this plasmoid air mixture then it goes into the engine and then it comes out into here. So the exhaust comes out of the engine, then it goes down a swirl guide and comes out. And this exhaust, there's a part in here where the, the positive and negative creates kind of like this, uh, this zero point. And this is what people kind of think it's, it feels a bit uh, like uh, free energy ish because they mentioned zero point, but that's apparently where you can transmute these, uh, all these uh, molecules into oxygen. So the exhaust comes out, it's, it's clean, basically clean exhaust. And this is all like based on like two inches with a, two, there's a two inch ball in the middle with a three inch ball with a four inch ball. It's all based on sacred, sacred geometry and dimensions. Like the whole thing is, is very interesting with the, the, the calculations that he's made. And he has a, he has like a, um, I'll just stop sharing now. I just happened to be sort of reading that yesterday for the show, but that's kind of like a really simple diagram of how the thing works. And it's supposedly, I mean, the, so uh, he had a whole team of people doing this demonstration. It seems to work. So this could be applied to like thousands of these uh, fuel generators that are in Africa, for example. Um, they would increase the efficiency. Um, they would e decrease the 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 pollution. I mean, it could be on cars. It could be on. There's one in there's one in the UK on a power plant in the UK. There's huge. So it's. Like, I think the ball was like this big on it. It was a huge thing. And it's been, it's been retrofitted on a big power plant in the UK. So it's, it seems to be, it seems to be going, but I mean, you know, he's been attacked and I mean, he had like, there's a couple of trolls in one of the chat groups that we're in. They're causing a ruckus and people are saying that, you know, Joe, 
Yeah, that's the thing, right? Did you guys did you guys know it was the only Rogan episode that we know of, at least, because we're well connected to Randall that didn't air. There was a Rogan episode recorded that was never I heard there was one with was um yeah, with Graham Hancock that didn't air. But I thought it was just a rumor. I don't know about Graham Hancock, but the one with Randall Carlson and uh Malcolm Bendall, the guy whose work Graham's talking about right now, definitely was recorded and did not air. I know that one hundred percent for mm. a fact. Wow. Wow. Unless I'm being told by people that I consider real good friends, like real good friends, you know, Mm. like we're business together, good friends. But was this quite recent, this episode, didn't it? Because I I think I remember from the episode where he first mentioned about this new technology. Yeah. Rogan said he was was getting back on to talk about it. Yeah, it was like two. They did, yeah. Yeah, it was like two months or a month. It was with a few months after the last Randall appearance. I would like to say February, maybe this year or something like that. Okay. Mm. That makes yeah. sense because the episode never came and I was wondering where, why it never came. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there's been a big, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, Joe's just protecting Randall. Randall's getting scammed by this guy. and then, But, I mean, I just don't think that's the case. I think the guy is, he's very spiritual. He has a really, really unique spiritual perspective on it. He's he's made he's made a, a sort of a theory of everything type thing where he's got time involved in it, and it takes Randall's sort of sacred geometry and even expands it a little bit more. And he's figured out he the frequencies of the elements. So each element is has this frequency, um, which is how you're able to transmute them, I guess. If you know the frequency of an element, you can create stuff that, you know, that will, I guess, will, will resonate with it. So it's it's really, really... Uh, fascinating. I think, I mean, I, I've heard that even like India is involved, the country of India, where with uh, with some of their Navy, they're getting involved. Like, so it seems like people are taking him seriously, whether you want to, you know, whether the the people in the Western uh, atheist kind of, you know, uh, scientism, they're never going to accept this. I mean, because he can't really explain it in in a term that that that, that our, our scientists can understand because they're they're still thinking in terms of relativity. Right. You know, and he's like, no, this is this is not. It, it's all based on ancient uh, Vedic, you know, knowledge, right? Uh, that's crazy. That is actually crazy. That's what I love about it so much is like the 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 orig- the origin story of this is so fascinating because it's so spiritual. Like it's it's the way he talks about it. It's like the one the one like when you find out. He I, and I can't I can't even repeat it properly, but he, he some paraphrase when you find out this one thing, it's the answer to everything, and that's kind of what the Vajra the Vajra is all about. And and I guess he thinks that's what that Tessa said too, didn't he? Uh, I think he said, I think he said three, six, and nine, or something is the answer to everything, or or it's vibration, uh, vibration, frequency, and energy is is everything. But. Uh, but he uh, he thinks that the you know the Taurus you've heard of the Taurus that's sort of like a donut shaped thing where the energy flows in this Taurus shape. Um, I mean, I could show you some graphics and stuff about that too. But the Taurus um, he thinks is uh, is the way that these water mo- these water bubbles collapse in a in a in a toroid. If you look at the cross section of a Taurus, it's like a Vajra. That's kind of what he's saying. Right. Okay. That's mind blowing that he's managing to put all that's take some mind power to be able to put this back together. Not just my hardest I mean, problem with it is just that you know, how about it's like it's our buddy's buddy. I mean, it just seems too crazy to be true, you know. You end up being buddies with a guy that you know, I guess it happens to everyone all the time. But it was more of a download type, like he, he talks about downloads, right? And plasma is like sentient. So, I mean, he, it gets crazy because he talks about the plasmas toy. He infused himself with this plasmoid stuff too. I mean, and, and it communicates with him. He can get downloads. I mean, it gets deep, deep, that deep. Crazy. Which, yeah. The, <laughs> I know. Leave that out. <laughs> well, no, but I'm going to be honest because that's one of the things that people use, right. As against it. Oh, you know, this guy's just cuckoo crazy, but well, you know, some you of think us, this is, a, this is a step in, the direction of free energy. Well, I do think so because even though it's not free now, the technology could be used for, you know, to, to better it. I mean, he's developing a turbine based on this technology. So he talks about spaceships. He talks about 
a global energy system that if you can harness the ionospheric electricity that comes down into the earth, he's got a whole design where it comes into the mountain. You build a tunnel down a mountain with a with a, a horizontal tube coming out, a horizontal cave coming out the other side, and you can harness this energy for the planet. If you if you put a a rod up to the ionosphere, so it's I mean, and people are doing this electroculture thing now everywhere too, and that was like really huge in the early 1900s, and they squashed that somehow, but. There seems to be like a way to harness the electricity from the ether and and use it. So he's got which big we know you can. We're this. doing that like we're we're already doing that on a mass scale on like a on like the rudimentary level of that by smashing atoms together and just pulling fucking giant amounts of energy, sometimes uncontrollable amounts of energy, out of seemingly nothing to the naked eye. Or to like even not the naked eye. Unlimited supply of that shit too. It's um that's actually mind blowing, to be honest. Are more people using him as a role model to go down the same direction? Or because uh, I don't know. Go ahead, that. Darren. What was that? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Are people using what? Malcolm. Yeah, what what they're fundamentally building on because there's so many people right that have quite have raised questions about ancient civ civilizations right and what what technologies they had, and obviously that's a massive step towards replicating that or at least acknowledging what's going on there. Are there groups of people heading in that direction? Are we going to see more and more of this crop up once we see it used on things that it's being used on right now? For example, yeah, it's just yeah. been used in the UK. Yeah, I think so. Exactly. Lifting megalithic blocks. I mean, look, so did you hear Stephen Greer's whistleblower talk about seeing a megalithic block being lifted in an underground facility? I mean, this is like what we're talking about. I mean, you're levitating these ancient, these megalithic blocks in secret, this government underground base. And I mean, I think Malcolm would admit that the pyramids and all these are sort of megalithic structures are also um, using this type of technology too. I mean, that's kind of what... Randall was mentioning on Joe Rogan, right? About like, hey, you know, this ancient technology, we need to dig into this ancient technology because it was working. I mean, they they definitely built these things using some crazy technology. 100%. Yeah, I think people are going to catch on to it. Well, maybe not a crazy technology. Like when I looked, when I really started looking into that stuff from Egypt, I mean, I found mining equipment that leaves marks that I would argue look almost identical, would look almost identical to the marks we've seen at some of those places after, say, 10, 20,000 years of erosion. But the, this is, we're talking about like cutting edge, hydraulic and electric or fuel powered mining equipment that's got robotic arms that can zigzag into stuff and cutting blades that are cutting stuff and Stuff that's like at the cutting edge of our stuff that would probably still need bigger versions of it to do what they were doing. At the, you know, we're still not quite there yet. But I don't think it was. I'm, I'm more convinced that Chuck and Marty are onto it when they say it's just like uh, some sort of cutting. Cutting yeah. machine. What do you guys more... think the pyramids were built for? Uh, I think it was used for initiation. Um, I think I think that's what it was used for, uh, mystery school initiation. Whether it was originally built for that or not, I don't know. I mean, we had a guy on that. I think, I think this is one of Darren's favorites too. Is we had the land of Cam on our and uh, the, it's on our YouTube actually too. It's on our on our other show, and he thinks it was manufacturing chemicals and and so even like an ammonia for ammonia for fertilizer. He thinks the red pyramid or the bent pyramid, which one is it, Darren? The uh or the step. It might even be the step. I can't I get all those other all those other pyramids are unbelievable. They're even better than it's even more amazing than Giza in a lot of ways. Not so big, but the in, inside chambers and stuff is unbelievable. And he thinks that those were used to make ammonia. And then you can make all kinds of stuff with ammonia. Definitely which a lot of the same similar architecture inside all of them. I think, well, before I had like Jeff, before we even had Jeffrey Drum on, I mean, I was in, we were in seven, six or seven pyramids in Egypt. 
you know, seven or eight months ago, maybe nine, ten months ago now. Um, but I think we went in almost all the ones you can go in. And uh, I came away without knowing any of the land of chem stuff. I hadn't been introduced to it, to it yet. And I came away. I was like, this is a machine of some sort. It's not meant for people. It was doing something. I thought my take is still that they're giant pressure chambers, different sizes for different pressures. When you can't roll and weld titanium steel, like we're doing our pressure chambers now, some of these things have four, five, six inches steel walls to contain you know, autoclaves and stuff like that, have crazy pressures inside them made out of steel cast iron and titanium and things like that and it i think it was just pressure uh pressure chambers made out of stone is what i came away with but at least machines of some kind and then i was introduced to jeffrey drum's work i don't know if it was chemicals or not but there's the smells are right i mean he's right about everyone's like the ammonia's from the bats but we went into a bunch of tombs and the serapium and all that kind of stuff and it didn't smell like that only the pyramids smell like that so whether that's an artifact or something. But I mean, I I also I have a little bit of standing because I've spent time building hospitals that have giant infrastructure sections to them, building high rises that have infrastructure floors on them, building infrastructure areas for airports. I've done shutdowns when I was working on the oil rigs. I worked in a gold mine for a couple of years when I was younger, working in the... Um, the part where they actually turn the, the mill, I think it was called, where they actually turn the rock into gold. And that's like going through like 10, nine or 10 different pressure chambers. And at the end of the day, this, the, it just, I got the same feeling walking through those pyramids as I did walking through these dams, mines, uh, mills, these things that are doing things, you know, whatever they're doing. It was the same sort of feeling in the pyramids. Like it wasn't, was made to do something. It has the shoots, this and the that. They were pouring stuff in, I think, and and doing something back in the day that I think had high pressures that they needed to contain somehow. And they had doors that I mean, one of them had doors like inside, way up inside. They had like uh, false uh, false doorways that would roll back and forth and open and close. And some of the early explorers like would feel something something switch in the pyramid when they were in there, and then a gust of wind would come in. So they're triggering some kind of like revolving door way up top. I mean, so they were sort of mechanically functional to a certain extent. I'm telling you that that I don't know if Jeffrey Jones right or not, but those things were machines for sure. Or for sure I like no one would ever convince me I did and I was like I did all the von Danik and stuff I was you know everything I went into Egypt that was the furthest thing from my mind it was the furthest thing from my mind that they were machines and after going into those pyramids I walked away thinking oh yeah this was with the exception of the one that we went in that had all the pottery in it but we don't know that that pottery wasn't just stashed there after by people after the fact that had found these tunnels underneath and were like, oh, fuck, we can live down here. We can hide out down here during this or that. Or, you know, there could have been people just throwing shit down there. Mm. Um, I've got a question that's a bit of a tangent, but I, I do want to ask it before we wrap up anyway. So I've been going down some rabbit holes and I can't seem to work out where my head's at with it. So I just want to ask what your opinions are. And it's around Antarctica and what's going on there, what's going on under there. <laughs> um, if you've got anything, then let me know, because my head's all over the place with it at the moment. We just, I have no idea. Yeah, it was, I don't know. We just asked somebody about that. Um, oh, right. So you, you guys are... Because, because they... Stuff. And he wouldn't really... It's, it sounded like he knew something, but he wouldn't really say it. But what was his main? I mean, so I think there's something going on there. There's something underneath. I think there's like an old uh, Agartha. I, I kind of feel like it's an old uh, ancient, you know, these old ancient places like Agartha or Hyperborea or these these things that, the, the, you know, and it's been, it's poles have shifted. It's in a different spot now. It's covered in ice, but it never used to be. There's something under there. There's something in there. We're not allowed there, really. I think there's that treaty that happened. I mean, there's Admiral Byrd's, Admiral Byrd's uh, 
uh, expedition out there. And I, so I think there's a, there's something to it. I mean, I, I read this book series in the nine, the late nineties called project saucer. I, we tried to get the, the author on named W a Harbinson. I'll never forget the, the guy. I think it's a pretty rare book series and I tried to get him on and it's about like a secret society, like about a, uh, a genius level guy who, who made UFOs and they went to, and it was like an ex Nazi. It was kind of like the mythology of like the Nazis, the super smart guy, um, you know, doing experiments on people and machines. And they ended up in Antarctica with this huge base and, and they were flying saucers out of there. And, and thinking back that that was like back in the nineties when this guy wrote this and it's fiction, but it really felt like it was based on some, some stuff that was sort of legit. I kind of, I kind of think that uh, it's, it's something like that. So, and he wouldn't come on the show. He's like, no, no, I can't come on. Talk about that. I'm like, wait, wait, talk about that. Yeah. I looked for my email a couple months ago. I'm like, I'm going to try again with this guy, especially with all the disclosure that's happening. Maybe he would come on, but I couldn't even find my old email. Hmm. Yeah, because with all these conspiracies or even theories that we have about anything to do with the world, there's relatively a lot of information on it. But what, until you get to Antarctica, it's like you can't find much at all. You find the odd few theories, which are, a lot of them are going to be far-fetched because people are just talking on a, on a video. But there's no hardcore conspiracy theories on it at all. Like they've people are scared to talk about it, like you say. Cam, did you Cam, did you ever see the heat map from Antarctica? No. Oh my god, you gotta look up that one. There was people were doing Wasn't those there some weird Fitbit shit too. Yeah, there's those weird Fitbit things, and somebody went and found uh, all the information from all the hit bits and hit bits, Fitbits and did a heat map. Really? And in Antarctica, underneath the snow, there's like a perfect oval, like an underground track that people are, oh. are using. And there's a whole bunch of spots in Antarctica that show they maybe look up like Antarctica heat heat map. A bit, bit fucking leak. Yeah. Right. It's going to be a bit of a difficult one to find, but yeah, if it's this, yeah, that's definitely some. That's definitely one you could go into. And uh, is this the one you saw? No, that's no, it's not quite, but it might be similar, you know. Um, it will take some digging, I'm gonna guess. Yeah, yeah, but definitely, definitely look for it. It's it's uh, it's pretty fascinating. Yeah, at this moment in time, I'm completely hooked on Antarctica because. Yeah, I, I, dude, I, I mean, I get it. We were gonna, we keep, I keep meaning to do a show on that, a deep dive, and we're gonna have uh, a guy on named um, Agnew Brooks Agnew. Have you ever heard of him? He'd be a good guy to look into. He was going to do what? a scientific expedition. Where Brooks Agnew on? Well, um, why? I want to, yeah. Isn't he the guy that, that can validate my Stephen Greer rumor? Oh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think he is. I we should have him on is. it. We'll talk about it in the second half. So he he, I think he had a scientific expedition a long time ago. Uh, this was probably six, seven years ago now to Antarctica, and it got canceled or something, so... He was, he's right into a lot of this stuff. Now we know a guy that knows him. We should have him on the show. Yeah, that would be an epic podcast. He's got a book, right? Birth. And I had a Mason, a Mason guy come up to me. We, we were on a trip together and he was like, yeah, I'm really interested in Antarctica and bird and all that. So from two, like at least two guys that I know that have official tie, like, or at least like Masonic ties or high, high government official guys. They know there's something on there and they can't really tell us, but they want to know more about it. So, I mean, I think you're onto one of the biggest sort of mysteries and one of the most legit mysteries that there is. And it definitely deserves more attention because I'm from what I'm hearing from a personal level from people that they're like, well, I can't really say much, but I'm inter very, very interested in it. Mm, yeah. Uh, yeah. More people need to be looking into it, but there's a reason why it's one of the less spoken about things because it probably it's there's something there that's from a from i think he's a high level freemason that's interested in ancient mysteries and the guy that worked for the cia and the navy seals so okay there's definitely information there to be uh to be gathered mm, rare. i'll give a look into it. so his uh, i'm just judging off his book um brooks agnew he believes that the earth's got there's two earths basically there's a division between another half of the earth. This is just gathering information from his book. Here. Wow, interesting. 
like inside and outside or um well i think well probably his book cover is probably the best way to demonstrate it. yeah don't judge a book by its cover by any means oh i wonder when he wrote that the 2017 Oh, okay. Yeah, that probably would have been around the time I heard him, maybe just before that or after that. Okay, I'm definitely going to look into this guy. Bingo, bango. And there's two volumes. Could be two different things. Brooks. I thought, it, oh, yeah, I did know it was Brooks. Never mind. Yeah, we should definitely have him on. I mean, at the moment, there's it's up to you can you can look into it and then you sort of discover that it's completely up to your imagination or anyone's imagination yeah. that you're listening to on what's <laughs> there so it's so easy just to get hooked into some random rabbit hole of oh and you see these pictures uh, you see these pictures of like ufos halfway sticking out of the snow or pyramids covered in snow and everybody's like oh look at antarctica and you're like is that real or not like you know you just don't know right well that's the other problem right is that we're experiencing now definitely with ai i think i saw something in the news maybe about four months ago um that someone posted a photo i think it was the i think it was the pentagon pentagon on fire and everyone share prices were dropping all over the place and it was an ai generated image so that's a problem that we're going to start experiencing soon not just from like the government side of them releasing ai generated images but from random people you me just sat here or anyone else just sat in front of their computer just generating something and pushing it out there. Yeah, yeah, or or and or and and or when when something happens an event like whatever it is, uh like an event like a fire in Lahaina or something or whatever, they can just inject some sort of you know, odd bit of conspiratorial disinformation to discredit the whole community, right? You know, a, a picture of, you know, a blue car or something, you know. Whatever whatever it may be, they can just inject it so easy now that they can just inject whatever is, you know, like the sound of freedom guy, the ma you know, oh, he has a Mason's tie, like just one little, you know, one little blurb of sort of misinformation will take like half the truth or community over to this psyop, you know? Yeah. It's crazy. And it's all about dividing all these communities that are coming up. So the more small things they can do to divide these smaller communities and even communities within communities, yeah. it's just going to cause yeah. chaos on all different yeah. levels. Yeah. Uh, but I just want to say thank you guys for coming on. This has been amazing. Well, this has been beyond amazing, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, right on. Yeah, been... Hopefully you don't get kicked off YouTube. <laughs> I don't know. Is it a punishment or more of a reward to get kicked off YouTube at this stage? Uh, but yeah, I just want to thank you both for yeah. coming on. Uh, Cheers, guys. Yeah, thanks, thanks boys. Thanks, thanks for boys. having us.